Okay, this is a screencast to hopefully get us caught up from the day that we missed because of the inauguration. And this screencast is all about disturbance. So um, as I talked to some of you with your lab reports or with your lab projects, it seems to me that some of you have an incorrect perception of what a disturbance is. So here are two textbook definitions. The first one comes from Wayne Souza. Uh, in the Annual Review of Ecology and Systematics from 1984, a discrete punctuated killing, displacement, or damaging of one or more individuals or colonies that directly or indirectly creates an opportunity for new individuals or colonies to become established. So when you get rid of some organisms in an ecosystem, what that does is it opens up ecological space, a niche space basically, and we'll talk about what niches are here in a little while, but it opens up niche space that might then allow other types of individuals, members of other species, to come in and become established. The definition from Chapin et al. 2002 is similar but slightly different, a relatively discrete event in time and space that alters the structure of populations, communities, and ecosystems and causes changes in resource availability or the physical environment. Well, these changes in resource avail availability and the physical environment, those are basically the openings in niche space that create opportunities for new individuals to become established. So pause this for a minute and, and ask yourself, well, what types of disturbance are there out there? And um, in those disturbance types, We've already talked about a couple of them, fire and grazing, but there, there are tons more. Just make a list on a sheet of paper what types of disturbance you might find. Pause the thing and do that. Okay, well, there are lots of types of disturbances. Um, they can be natural disturbances. They can be anthropogenic. These are all going to be dyads, two sides of the same coin. They can be large scale, they can be small scale, they can be frequent, they can be infrequent, they can be severe in terms of their intensity, they can be mild, they can be what are called press disturbances or they can be called pulse disturbances. Press disturbances are disturbances that tend to come onto an ecosystem and stay there for a period of time, whereas a pulse disturbance is something that is much more shorter duration. So for example, a hurricane or a tornado, those are pulse disturbances because they occur and a, and a hurricane may be situated over an island for less than 24 hours. It's a very severe disturbance because of the just size of it, but it doesn't stick around for very long. Whereas uh, suburbanization or urbanization is a press disturbance in that that is a disturbance that happens on an, in an ecosystem and then continues for longer periods of time. So you can think of these disturbance, uh, these aspects of disturbances as interacting with one another. So for example, you could put frequency on one axis and intensity on another axis. And one of the things that you find when you do this is that um, different kinds of disturbances occur in different places on this graph. So tree fall gaps, grazing, things like that, they're relatively high frequency, but their impact, their intensity is relatively low. Fires, forestry activities, floods, these occur less frequently than grazing does, and they're also relatively low intensity, but they can be higher intensity depending upon the, the um, intensity of, for example, a fire, or if the forestry activity is you know, clear-cut logging versus selective logging. Urbanization happens relatively frequently, but it's a fairly intense sort of um, sort of, of disturbance. And then you get really low frequency but very high intensity disturbances, such as glaciation or a volcanic eruption, something like Mount St. Helens. So. Um, you can also think of these in terms of scale. And so now rather than a two-dimensional um, box, you, a two-dimensional um, way of thinking about it, you can think of it in three dimensions. And so you have low or high frequency disturbances, low and high intensity disturbances, and then you have small scale and large scale disturbances. So once again, fires might be relatively high frequency, low intensity, small scale uh, affairs, but as you have heard about fires in California and things like that, sometimes these uh, fires occur at high frequency, but they are relatively large scale and can be relatively high intensity. So they would be in this three-dimensional box somewhere up here. Mount St. Helens in um, May of 1980, 
went from looking like this in your normal sort of mountain that you might enjoy going hiking on, uh, and uh, the next day it did this. And after, so this was a catastrophic volcanic eruption in Oregon, and it killed a number of people, and uh, the next day uh, it essentially looked like this. All of those forests that were in the foreground in this image have basically been burned up and, and laid waste to, buried under, uh, set on fire and buried under um, many, many, many feet of volcanic ash. This then is a very severe, infrequent sort of disturbance. And so what happens after disturbances is you begin to get temporal changes in community structure. And so, um, the community that is there begins to grow back. And so your, your textbook defines succession as a temporal change in community structure. Chapin et al. defines it as a directional change in ecosystem structure and functioning resulting from biotically driven changes in resource supply. I think I prefer the Chapin et al. definition here because it indicates that it's a directional change in structure and function and it's the result of biotically driven changes in resource supply. And so when we talk about succession, we're talking about what do organisms in the ecosystem that is undergoing change do to alter resource supply. And when you think about that, when we think about resource supply, the thing that should jump immediately into your brain is competition theory, because oftentimes competition is centered on resource supply, and your textbook talks about this. So after Mount St. Helens erupted, uh, very quickly, because it just covered the landscape in ash, there was still an intact ecosystem underneath all of that ash. And so relatively quickly, um, small plants began to grow up through the ash, presumably germinating from, from seeds underneath, because all of the all of the living plant matter had been scorched and killed because of, of the fire and so here you see small patches of grasses some forbs coming up and over time this, these are these are pictures of the same little little dry gulch taken over time and over time you can see that erosion begins to happen so you get down to rock uh, these are small shrubs now coming into play. Once again, small forbs uh, colonizing the area. And over time, the community, the plant community in, the case, in this case, begins to rebuild itself from the remnants of the old ecosystem that were there, there before. And given enough time, this thing will eventually grow back to be the forest that, that was there prior to the eruption. But succession is something that takes a lot of time um, to accomplish, and so succession proceeds slowly. And so we can think about these things as, as occurring in this, this space of frequency and intensity, and the worst, the worst uh, disturbances would be those that have high frequency and high intensity. But the cool thing about this is most disturbances don't occur here, and they don't occur here. They occur somewhere along this diagonal along the middle. And so things that tend to be high in frequency are oftentimes low in intensity, and things that happen to be really intense disturbances generally don't happen very often. And that's nice because otherwise your ecosystem is just constantly responding to this disturbance, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So after these disturbances, you can expect things with low intensity are not going to really change the ecosystem very much. So you should expect very little successional change. But as the intensity of the, ecos of the disturbance increases, you should expect more community change. In this case, medium intensity disturbances lead to uh, secondary succession. And in the case of things like glaciers and volcanic eruptions, it can basically um, degrade the ecosystem. The disturbance can degrade the ecosystem to the point that you go back and begin with, with rock. Uh, 
as your starting point, and that then is primary succession. So the difference between primary succession and secondary succession is secondary succession is succession that occurs when you already have certain elements of the original ecosystem still intact. You still have soil. There are seeds in that soil that can sprout, germinate very quickly after the disturbance. Primary succession is generally regarded as beginning from, from bedrock, from, from raw rock. There's no soil, there's no seeds, there's no organisms, period. And needless to say, primary succession occurs much more slowly than secondary succession does. Uh, this is a, f a figure from a book uh, illustrating a seer or a serial series, a series of community changes in uh, what is actually secondary succession. There's soil back here at the beginning, but the first thing that comes in to these environments uh, is annual plants, and then perennial plants take their place. As shrubs come in, because these plants have built up enough soil, you can see that the soil is changing depth over time. It's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. At the beginning, all the soil can support is annual plants. You need deeper soil to, to support perennial plants and grasses, and you need even deeper soil to support shrubs. So each of these stages of vegetative development basically set the stage to support the next stage of vegetative development. And as you can see, as the forest grows bigger and bigger, it begins to shade out these understory shrubs because of things like light competition. These shrubs basically shade out the perennial plants and grasses, once again, because of something like light competition. And so when the definition for succession invokes changes in resource availability, which is what this definition is showing you, this is what it's talking about. Some plants setting the stage for other plants to come in, and then those other plants that come in basically spell the doom of the plants that set the stage for them. And so you get this cycling through of, of community types. A uh, serial stage is just a distinct point along the sear, but the sear is a continuous sequence of change in a community. So we can think about communities in terms of the species that occur. And so if we have a graph of species one, from not very abundant to very abundant, species two not very abundant to very abundant, and species three not very abundant to very abundant, we can imagine a given community being made up of a little bit of species one, a little bit of species two, and a little bit of species three. Over time this community might change such that all of the members of the community just get more abundant. And so here you have a lot of species one, a lot of species two, and a lot of species three. This is a community changing over time, but they're changing mainly in the total abundance of organisms, not their relative abundance to one another. And we oftentimes think of succession in this sort of progressive sort of change, although that's not necessarily the best way to think about it. And when a disturbance comes in, we envision this as happening in such a way that the community is knocked back to some earlier stage of succession. And then once you've been knocked back to that earlier stage of, of community development, you go back through these various stages to the climax community, and then another disturbance comes and knocks you back. But a disturbance can knock you back at any point along this, this change in community structure. It could knock you back from the, the green community to the red community or anywhere along these arrows. And our traditional way of thinking about succession is very linear like this. You go from the red community to the green community to the blue community, a disturbance happens, knocks you back to the red community, and then you go to the green community and the blue community until disturbance occurs. But we actually have have become a little more nuanced in our understanding of disturbance because what can also happen is that we go through these successional changes and when a disturbance comes along rather than altering community structure back to a situation where species one species two and species three are all at low abundance it actually knocks us back to a place where species one is in higher abundance, species two is still in low abundance, and species three is in low abundance. And over time, what happens is 
Species 1 doesn't really change very much in its abundance at all, but species 2 and species 3 become more abundant. And so now what has happened is this disturbance hasn't knocked you back to an earlier successional stage that the community had previously gone through. It knocks you back in successional time, but onto a different successional trajectory, such that the community that you get at the end of this form of secondary succession is different from the community that you came from ultimately. And as we study um, succession after various types of, of disturbances, we actually find that this is the more common form of, of succession. You may grow back to something that superficially resembles the original community that you started with, but when you start looking at the individual species that are there, you either find that some species are not there that were there before, or you find that their relative abundances have changed in ways that really do alter the structure and function. A classic example of this is the site that I work in in Puerto Rico, where there's old coffee plantation right up next to relatively un undamaged forest. And when you look at the two forests, they look alike. They're big trees, they're tropical trees, they're very tall, it's beautiful. But if you stand on the trail and listen to either side of the trail, you actually hear different species of birds coming into your right ear and a whole different community of birds coming in through your left ear. And it's because one of them on the right used to be a coffee plantation and the other one is a relatively undisturbed forest. If you go into those forests and begin counting trees, it becomes very clear to you very quickly that those two forests are different because the tree species that are there are different. There's similar numbers of trees in those two places, but the species that are there and their relative abundances are different. And so the disturbance imposed upon the environment by the coffee plantation put that forest on a different trajectory and that forest grew into a different kind of forest than the forest that never had that disturbance. So what drives these successional changes? Well, Chapin et al. 2002 would tell you that the things that drive these changes are alterations in resource availability that are driven by the organisms that are on the landscape. So this requires us to think about um, succession in terms of competition and it requires us to envision competition differently than we did earlier in the semester. So in this case we're going to use a model proposed by a guy named David Tillman back in the 1980s where he basically looks at competition as being driven by resources. So here we have a, a one of my favorite dimensionless graphs from this is resource one and you can have none of it or you can have a lot of it and so let's just say that this is something like light. And then we have resource two, and it can vary from having none of it to having lots of it. And let's just say that this is nitrogen supply in the soil. Light and nitrogen are two resources that plants need in order to grow. But there are some species of plants that need light more than they need nitrogen. And there are other plants that are good competitors for light, so they don't really need that much light, but they might need high levels of nitrogen in the soil. And so we can graph the resource needs of any particular species by imagining, well, how much light do you need and how much nitrogen do you need? And then that sets up a zero net growth isocline such that this is the, the line of light availability below which you can't grow, but above which you can grow. So there's positive growth on this side of the line, negative growth on this side of the line. This is the level of nitrogen that represents your minimum requirement of nitrogen. So you can grow if you have more nitrogen than that, but you can't grow if you have less than that. So this would represent a species that is more limited by nitrogen supply than it is limited by light supply. In the same way, we can imagine another species that is not very limited by light. It's a good competitor for light, but it needs a lot of nitrogen. And so this is the zero net growth isocline of this species. It is most limited now by nitrogen supply, not by light supply. It can survive on relatively low amounts of light. Well, these two species can coexist in, an, in a competition sort of way because they have different resource needs. We talked about this back when we talked about competition in the past. 
positive growth is over here, negative growth is over here, but there is a range of resource availabilities, availabilities of light and nitrogen, over which these two species can coexist. And they're determined basically by the rate at which the species use these resources. And so drawing a line from the, the zero point out to the intersection of the requirements of the green species indicates the rate at which this species uses light versus nitrogen. And this species uses nitrogen relatively slowly, but uses more light per unit of nitrogen. The next species, the, the yellow species, uses a lot more nitrogen relative to the amount of light that they use. So these lines, these resource utilization vectors, represent the resource needs of the two species. And the way you can figure out where in this range of resource availabilities the two species can survive is by basically taking these two lines and moving them to this intersection point because this is an intersection point where you can have stable coexistence. Speci the green species is at zero net growth and the yellow species is at zero net growth. And when we move those to those areas, these are just parallel lines. The yellow line is parallel to this yellow line. The green line is parallel to this green line. This represents a range of resource availabilities at which the green species and the yellow species can coexist. If you get into this area over here, both species, as they grow, because in this case, both species are above their zero net growth isocline, so they're both growing, but they deplete resources. And they deplete resources such that you're going to reach the resource limit of the green species before you reach the resource limit of the yellow species. And as a result, the yellow species will continue growing, depleting, in this case, nitrogen available sorry, depleting light availability until you get to its apex here and you drive the green species to extinction. If you begin here, you're closer to the yellow species limit. And so this species is going to just continue surviving under low levels of nitrogen, driving the yellow species to extinction. And then the green species will settle at this level of, of light. And then at that point, intraspecific competition will basically limit the growth. Of, of that species. Well, here is a lava flow in Hawaii, and you can see that, or, I, well, okay, I don't know that it's in Hawaii. Actually, I don't think it is in Hawaii. Here's a lava flow, and you can see some, some plants coming out of the lava, but this represents a high light, low nutrient situation. There's no soil here, so there's very few nutrients in soil that these plants can take advantage of. But what there is, is there's no canopy from, from trees and things like that. So these plants are getting all of the light that they could possibly need, and they are getting very little nutrients. And so the only plants that can live here are plants that need a lot of light, but don't need a lot of nitrogen. On the other hand, this is some after some succession has occurred, and you see that these are bigger plants, but they're on a nice, um, landscape filled with soil, but there's more competition for light because you have all of these plants growing here. This is later in succession. You have more soil nutrients because there's deep enough soil there to have soil nutrients, but there's more competition for light. The ty types of organisms that can survive under these conditions are organisms that can survive less light but need more nutrient availability afforded by soils. And so when you think about this situation, you can basically put plant communities on this graph and you can have one species that needs a lot of light and very few nutrients, another that needs a little less light but needs a little more nitrogen, a little less light, a little more nitrogen, a little less light, a little more nitrogen, a little less light, a little more nitrogen. These are different species that can all live on a landscape, but whether or not they can survive there is dependent upon how much light and nitrogen are availability versus what their requirements are for those things. If you then go and look at the resource needs, their, their resource utilization vectors, and transpose those in ways, you can see that this species and this species can coexist in this narrow range, 
of, of resource availabilities. And the reason that the range is narrower than in the first example is because the resource needs are more similar to one another. You can take the first one's resource utilization and put it on the red line and put the red lines, the red lines one there, and you can see that species one, this species here and the red species here, can coexist over a broader range of, of environments um, than the two lighter species here can, but that's because their resource needs are less similar to one another. Now, the three can coexist only when you find where all of these things overlap. And so what's going to happen over successional time is this species will grow into the environment and live just fine until it's created enough soil that this species can come in. And then for a time period, these two species can coexist with one another. Well, species one could also coexist with species three here as well. And so you go from one species down here to two species in this range right here to three species, including the red species in this range right here. But very quickly, you discover that, well, this species and the red species actually can't coexist there. They can only coexist here. So you actually go from one species to two species to one species, which is the second light line species, to then two species where the light line and the, and the red line species can occur. So what happens as you move from the lower right to the upper left is you go through a cycling of different species being phased out by the introduction of new species, but it's the early species, these species down here, that set the stage for these species to coexist and survive. And you can see this going through and over successional time, you basically move from a situation where there's lots of light and very little nutrients to a place where there's lots of nutrients and very little light. This environment supports these kinds of species. This environment supports these kinds of species. And so the direction of succession moves from here, whoop, from this corner up to this corner, across this this range of resource combinations. And when we go and look at actually uh, actual ecosystems going through the process of succession, we can look at uh, forest change in New Hampshire after a clear cut. And this was a clear cut that was done in the 1960s, the late 1960s. And you can see that by 1970, a bunch of sugar maples and beech trees have grown into the environment. Beech trees being early successional tree species that have lots of light requirements. But over time, as the community begins to fill up with sugar maple trees, the beech trees decline in their uh, percent of the total biomass, and they'll decline and level off. Sugar maples reach their apex in 1971 in terms of abundance, and then they start to decline because what happens is these other species, like pin cherry and raspberry and yellow birch, start to grow in, and over time, the pin cherry basically shades out a lot of these other species, and the yellow birch grows much more slowly, and it's going to be one of the one of the climax sort of species in this in this environment and it will eventually years later be shading out a bunch of these relatively early successional species and so we see this shift in the community composition from one year to the next year to the next year to the next year to the next year and these are the kinds of predictions that Tillman's model for how you can look at resource limited competition acting that resource limited competition results in changes in community structure over time. Other factors, of course, that can affect this are things like herbivory and predation, weather, you know, abiotic factors, and just the general environmental heter heterogeneity that goes along with disturbance, because we've already talked about how disturbances don't occur equally everywhere. But a couple of examples of this are this situation on uh, forests in the Appalachian Mountains where one of the disturbances is actually uh, an insect outbreak that has killed a bunch of these trees and left these trees intact. 
that then creates ecological space where these trees could potentially move up the mountain because they're no longer experiencing uh, competition from these trees but it could be that these trees will just go away and there will be meadows in the end up here because these trees have abiotic limits as to where they can grow and they can't proceed any further up the mountain than that. Uh, here's a situation where we have the effects of grazing as a disturbance. Uh, ungrazed land on one side and, and overgrazed land on the other side. These grazers are obviously preferring grass and not preferring whatever this weedy form is. Um, once again, spatial variation. And there's even heterogeneity in terms of what is growing back here in terms of, of successional change. So one of the disturbances that we think about in, um, in Kanza is fire. But the fires in Kanza are different from the fires that you have back in California. And so where in this frequency intensity graph would fires at Kanza be? Are they going to be um, high frequency, low intensity? Are they going to be medium intensity and medium frequency? Or are they going to be relatively low frequency, high frequency fires? Well, you can put fire at Kanza somewhere on this graph in the same way that you can put the forest fires in California somewhere on this graph. So do that and be able to, to bring that to class and say, okay, this is where I put fire intensity and frequency. Does that actually comport with what we know about fire at Kanza? And I think that pretty much catches us up. So after you watch this screencast, come to class on Wednesday with any questions you have over disturbance, over the Tillman style competition graphs, which I realize uh, some people struggle with, and I'll answer any of those questions that you have. Thanks for listening in.